Today I want to bring you along for a kitchen chat that I had with a lovely lady named Amy all about how to preserve fresh food and save money in the process. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, cultured dairy, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Well recently this lovely lady, Amy, her name is Amy Cross, invited me to be on her channel for a kitchen chat. Amy has the YouTube channel Cross Legacy and also has a website by the same name. Now you may know Amy from her very popular Instagram site where she shows people how to extend the life of fresh food. And in the process of being able to extend the life of fresh food, you wind up being able to go to the grocery store less. And in turn, the less you go to the grocery store, the more money you're able to save. Plus, the nice thing about extending the life of fresh food is that you wind up wasting a lot less, often wasting nothing, because you've extended the life of your fresh food and you're able to use it all up before you have to replace it. So Amy invited me to chat with her about this as well as food storage in general on her channel here on YouTube. But she was also very kind to share the interview with me so I could put it here on my channel. But no matter where you watch this kitchen chat, I hope that you will visit with Amy and learn so much from her about how to extend the life of fresh food and save money in the process and throw out a lot less. I'll have all of Amy's social media information in the description below so you can head over and visit her YouTube channel or her website or her Instagram. Alrighty, well let's get into the kitchen chat. I'm here today with Mary from Mary's Nest and I am so excited because I've actually been following her for years so much so when her YouTube videos are playing in my house my family recognizes her voice and knows exactly who I'm listening to so I am just I am so thrilled this is the first time I'm like leading a interview kind of thing but we're just going to have a back and forth conversation and share our knowledge and just hopefully this will bless everybody that gets to watch this. So um, my name is Amy Cross from The Cross Legacy. I'll talk more about me later, but I am so excited to introduce you to Mary. Mary, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do? Hi, Amy, and uh, hello to all of your sweet friends here on The Cross Legacy. It's so nice to meet you, and thank you so much for having me visit with you today. Uh, and you gave me a lovely introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Mary, Mary Schrader, and I have the YouTube channel Mary's Nest. And I teach all about traditional cooking, as I say, traditional cooking for the modern pioneer. Emphasis on modern. We're very happy we have indoor plumbing. <laughs> But I teach how to make bone broth and ferments and sourdough and basically, uh, Amy, like what you and I have in common, how not to waste and make use of everything. And so uh, I'm really looking forward to us chatting and sharing uh, the different things that we do to keep food fresh and to store food and uh, just to have a thrifty, efficient kitchen. Absolutely. I just, I love following you to make sure that the things that I've kind of grown up knowing, like making sauerkraut, that it was actually safe. And I can always trust that everything that you post are safe recipes oh. and safe techniques. And I, I truly value that because there's so much other information on the internet that not always is safe. <laughs> so I, um, I really appreciate that you always give us safe techniques to use to make food storage and, and healthy things for our family. Yes, you know, it's funny. I have a funny story to tell you because what talking about food safety, you know, especially with fermentation, I, you know, I always tell people make a little investment in the pH strips. They're very affordable. You can usually get them at the pharmacy or even if you have like a pharmacy right in your grocery store. 
And that way you, because people, viewers would write to me and they'd go, how do I know for sure that it's below this VH? And I'd say, it's actually pretty easy to test, you know, and then you can feel safe because people would say, I don't want to make anybody sick. And oh gosh, I so understand that. I would never want to make anybody sick. And uh, so I really put a lot of emphasis on that. I'm not a rebel fermenter or a rebel canner. <laughs> I'm actually kind of afraid of those <laughs> things because I do, I do worry about food safety. And I'll tell you, you know, it's funny. I grew up drinking raw milk. We really didn't, it was just milk. We didn't really think anything about it. You could probably can relate. And when I got married and my son was born and when he was a little older and able to, you know, drink cow's milk, raw, raw cow's milk, I found a source for it here where I live in Texas. And it was so funny because I was a little nervous about it because you know, I mean, the dairy looked clean, everybody looked healthy, but you know, you don't know for sure. So I bring it home, I have a gallon, I think I bought two gallons. And over the course of a few days, I drank one entire gallon myself. And when I, once I was still alive, I said, okay. <laughs> that is safe to give to your, your family. <laughs> And my, and it's cute because my husband, he's not a, a raw milk person. You know, I do try to get the, uh, um, it's low temp pasteurized and unhomogenized. So he has to shake it for him. You know, I feel at least, well, that's something. Uh, and my son likes different types of fermented foods. But when I started making kefir or kefir, mm -hmm. depending on how people pronounce it, that's totally new to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up with that. And when, uh, I was actually, this was so long ago, uh, maybe over 20 years ago or more, I was just chit-chatting and I think it, it was like on Yahoo, that they didn't even have Facebook. And I had just got into this little group and I was chit-chatting with this lady who lived up in New Mexico. And she said, oh, I have these grains, I'll send you some, just send me an envelope with the postage. And I get an envelope in the mail with a little plastic bag with these grains in it. And I decide I'm going to culture these and make this thing kefir. <laughs> and my husband is like, you don't know this lady. What if it's poison? You know, and I've never seen, you know, this was the book, you know, there were no books or anything right. that I knew of about this. And I culture it and I make kefir and I say to my son, Oh, you want to try some of this? They call it the champagne of milk. And he goes, oh, thank you, mama, but I don't drink. <laughs> oh, that's adorable. <laughs> We're really lucky here. I grew up on a large um, farm. And when it was my dad's generation and my grandpa's generation, it was like a fifth generational farm. It was a dairy farm. So by the time I was growing up, they had retired out of it. But um the milk that they delivered went to this dairy called Smith Brothers. And Smith Brothers still delivers milk to this day. Like even 100 years later, they just had their 100 year anniversary. So we just, within the last hour, I've had a milk delivery delivered here to my house. Um, oh and it's just God, kind of fun. Heaven. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I don't have to, that's one of the reasons why I can spread out grocery shopping trips so long because every other week we get milk delivered. Um, oh, that but, is fantastic. but it's just kind of a fun thing that people around the country don't think about, but everybody here in the Seattle area knows about Smith Brother delivery. But my grandparents were like one of the dairy farms that was part of that. And then my great grandfather, who was 104 when he passed away when I was born, but he is the one that had the patent for the milk canisters, the 10 um, yes. the milk jugs that they used in World War II. And so my grandpa actually got to come home from World War II because it was so important for them to make these padded in milk jugs um, because food security was so scarce at that time. So yeah, the whole like dairy farm and milk and, you know, the milk cans, like just, it's, it's history to me. <laughs> it's part of our family. It's, it's kind it's, of fun. It's your family history. That That is t uh, so amazing. And it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, about the food scarcity and, you know, the depression, World War II. Uh, I always find it interesting what, because to me, when I was growing up, that didn't seem very far away. 
my parents lived through the Great Depression and they lived through World War II and the scarcity. And then my father was in the Korean War and their attitude, my parents' attitude, my mother's 98. It's, it's hard to believe. My dad lived into well into his 80s, uh, but he's since passed. But my mom is still alive. But I was born in the 50s, in the mid-1950s. And my parents were always talking about the Great Depression, and they were always talking about World War II. And their attitude was, it, coming, it can come back. <laughs> you know, we have to be prepared. We can't just be sitting on our laurels, you know, because the 1950s are, are good. And, and then it was funny when the 1970s hit and then there was stagflation. And at that time I was, it was like high school and college for me. And uh, it was funny because my mother would say, see, I told you, <laughs> you know? these things can happen again. And you know, she's waiting in the gas lines and all of that, you know. And so I, I suspect that both of us, you know, and from what you have shared, you know, on your YouTube channel and also being a fifth generation dairy family, uh, that you really understand uh, going through, you know, your, your family history, going through fam uh, the scarcity of food and not just scarcity of food, but what's involved in raising and creating food. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because we were on, you know, a farm. So we always had meat. We always had produce like I can just like my grandma can, you know, all those kind of things. And looking back, like, so I'm a generation behind you. Um, so looking back, I don't really remember my mom ever really stocking like flour or like stocking her like grocery store pantry items like and it's not really something I kind of grew up thinking about like yes we preserve the harvest and yes we get you know meat delivered once a year you know and have a full freezer and a generator in case the power goes out <laughs> but um that idea of like stocking butter or stocking you know all those other items that you need to make the meal or make those items that wasn't something that I was really raised doing and we're an allergy family. And when the first beginning of the pandemic started and all of a sudden we're soy, gluten, dairy, raw sugar cane, I'm a diabetic. And then we have one vegetarian in the family. So like when everybody's home, like we have a lot of things <laughs> we're dealing with. And, you know, all of a sudden I couldn't get gluten-free flour and I couldn't get, you know, things that I needed for when my, my daughters are home. And, um, and that was that was eye opening and it was scary. And for the first time, you know, in my generation or the millennials generation, like they're really starting to understand that, yeah, at any second our store shelves could be empty and, you know, or we just can't get, you know, like the allergy items that we need or those random, you know, items that you don't think about that you just think that you can always go to the grocery store and get and, you know, all of those lessons of our grandparents, our great grandparents trying to instill in us, like came like rushing back. And now everybody realizes how important it is to have food security in your house or like the rising prices of groceries to even be able to afford being able to get the groceries that you need if they are at the grocery store. And, you know, that's why some of my tips have just went viral and it's, it's been shared and spread so much. Um, like five years ago, one of my girlfriends, she was like, oh, Amy, you have to teach me about lettuce. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, well, I have to go get lettuce like every three days. And we can like literally see Costco from our neighborhood. Like it, we're so close to grocery stores. Like there's like a Costco, Target, Walmart, Fred Meyers, like all within two stoplights of where our neighborhood is. And, and I'm like, well, that's great. You're eating salads. Like, you know, you're having to go get lettuce, you know, every couple of days. That's great. And she's like, no, it's going bad. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like we go to the same stores. Like, what do you mean it's going bad? And she was like, well, it, you know, the produce at the stores is just so bad and it's going bad every couple of days. And I'm like, um, no, like my lettuce, like we use it and we have zero food waste. Like I, 
I don't get this. And I was um, just, I pulled this out a minute ago, but I keep lettuce and I actually wouldn't even let my husband eat this last piece of lettuce because I wanted to show it to you. But this piece of lettuce, I broke it yesterday for a video, but it's actually a month old right now. So it's just, we don't waste lettuce. I've taught I've taught skills and I've learned from our neighbors and our grandparents how to wash items and how to store it properly and it just doesn't get thrown away. And it's so interesting that like the average family throws away 40% of the food that they're buying. You know, and I just, it's just this concept that I don't understand. Like I, <laughs> I just don't, you know, understand like, oh, it's garbage day. We need to clean out the fridge. Like we don't do that. <laughs> we eat the food until it's gone. No, I, I can so relate to what you're saying that when I read that about waste, I'm just shocked because my parents never wasted anything. My mother made meals from scraps and no one would know it was scraps, you know, or no one would know that things were maybe getting a little close to their prime or past their prime, so to speak. And I'll, I'll tell you something cute that... Uh, I remember one day my father was sitting here at my kitchen table having a cup of coffee and the newspaper came and it had a rubber band around it and I threw the rubber band in the garbage, it was all dirty. And my father said, what are you throwing out? And he said, oh my goodness, Mary, my, my given name is Mary Louise, you know, and so whenever I tell stories of my parents and my mother, they're, they're, they're always saying, Mary Louise, you know, <laughs> and my father's like, Mary Louise, what are you throwing out? I'll take that rubber band home with me. That's like something good that can be used, you know, and, you know, he had all the little coffee cans in the garage with every little piece that you might need. And if something was broken, he would say, oh, I think I have something to fix that. <laughs> yeah. and, and my mom, you know, she always uh, had a very well-stocked pantry, a lot of homemade things, like you're saying that you take after your uh, grandmother and do the home canning and all of that. And it's cute because I was, um, my, grandmother and my grandfather are from Italy. And then my mother was raised here in the United States. But my grandmother always had a garden, she had an apple tree, uh, nothing was wasted, everything, you know, was made homemade. And then my mother carried that over into when she got married with my father, and, you know, had a well stocked pantry making everything homemade, wasting nothing. And I, I it's so funny, because I remember very little go, I, I never remember food going into the garbage. Right. Whatever went into the garbage, I don't even remember the garbage can, you know? <laughs> it seemed like my parents made use of everything. It's funny because I think of, was there a big thing about taking the garbage out? I can't remember. And what's cute is we all lived on the same street. And my grandmother, my aunts, uh, my parents, you know, and at one point, this was very suburban. And at one point, my father said, I think we need to go live in the country. Now, living in the country meant simply moving from the southern part of the county where we lived to the northern part of the county <laughs> and getting a few acres, you know. And But it was very cute because I think uh, both my parents had this like country heart. Mm -hmm. I think their dream would have been to be like your family to, or, or uh, we were talking earlier, you know, about uh, another gal who's got many generations, you know, of, of ranching. You had many generations of a dairy farmer. I think that my parents had that heart to, to try to at least capture some sense of a country life and, and have the feeling of, oh yes, I've been doing this all my life. You know? <laughs> I kind of feel uh, like that right now. <laughs> but. Uh, my father was so cute because, you know, he, he, we had the well and the septic and all of that. And I remember once the well got hit with lightning and he's out there trying to fix the well. But he loved every minute of it. You know, it's cute. But my mom, yeah, she was very good about, you know, keeping a very well-stocked pantry. And I grew up in New York and, you know, we could get blizzards and snowstorms mm -hmm. and all of that. And I, 
she was so calm about everything, you know, because she always was prepared. And I have to be very honest with you that as a young working woman before I got married, okay, I had groceries and whatnot, but I, I certainly wasn't prepared for if something like 2020 had mm -hmm. hit us. Yeah, you know, and then it, it's interesting because after I got married, then I started really thinking. And I got married a little later in life. I had my son when I was in my 40s. And it was funny because I would say, gee, you know, I better make sure, you know, but I live in Central Texas. It's always mild here. Oh, and yeah. So By storms. Really, you know, yeah, I don't really. Yeah, exactly. And so it's mild. So we're going along. And then I am so grateful because this is going way back. There was some health incident like in another country. It wasn't here in the United States. And my husband just looked at me and he goes, gee, do we have enough like food and water? My son was a little boy and we ripped everything out of the clothes, the, uh, what do you call the hall closet? <laughs> And we started putting in shelves and we were, he and I were so happy because I think we really had the prepper heart and uh, we started stocking up and thank God, because by the time 2020 hit and then I thank God I had food to get us through, you know, everybody was really afraid. You didn't know, you know, what was going to happen. And then I learned a lot of lessons when the ice storm hit in 2021. <laughs> You were talking about a generator. We had, uh, we, we thought we were so prepared. We had a little generator. Oh my gosh, I couldn't even run the coffee pot on it. Oh, no. <laughs> we can run half the house on ours. And, and I, I think I even made a video where I, a while back, where I said, okay, this is what I learned and this is now what I have. You know, uh, but, and then, 2022, well, we're going along, weather's great. 2023, another ice storm hits. This is like, what? What's going on here? You know, I live in central Texas between Austin and San Antonio. We don't get ice storms <laughs> like this. And, but thank goodness, you know, we were often paralyzed in both storms for about a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, like, you made such a good point about young people having gone through these times now, recognizing the importance of stocking food and storing it properly. But to your point, there are some things that store very easily. Mm -hmm. But then what do you do about fresh fruits and vegetables? And your video about how to, not just one, you have many, you're talking about the lettuce, and I'd love to, you know, hear more about that uh, and how you, you keep strawberries for like a month. Yeah, these are this, a month old right now. This is really uh, very, these tips are really helpful because it's not just about trying to preserve them based on what you bought at the grocery store. A lot of us have gardens mm -hmm. and Yes, we can ferment things. Yes, we can home can things. But how nice if we can take lettuce and here we can pretty much, you know, ice storms. I don't know what to think anymore now about gardening in Central Texas. But normally are are what you would consider winter months. We can garden. And that's usually when we can grow all these what you would call like cold weather crops. Mm -hmm. And if you get like a nice... Um, abundance of lettuce how nice to be able to preserve it in a fresh state so that you can then make salads because yeah it's great soups are wonderful and stews and serving it you know chopping it up as a side dish or whatever but the idea of being able to make it especially like if it's february here and it's hitting you know it's so unpredictable now but if it's 70 <laughs> degrees how nice that we can just have lettuce that we maybe grew through three weeks earlier and we put it in our fridge. So I'd love to hear more about how you do all of this. Well, I grew up on the fifth generational farm, as I said, and um, it was my, my dad's side of the family. So um, the time I was born and remember, my grandma had passed away and we lived with my grandpa and we had two houses. There was like the big house and the little house next door. And my mom's family had grew up in town 
and they had um, they always had a big city garden, and we have a garden here in town also, and chickens <laughs> in our backyard. But um, when my grandpa passed away on my mom's side, my grandma ended up moving in um, at the other house. So I grew up with my grandpa and my grandma, but it was my mom's mom and my dad's dad. And, you know, having farmers and canners, you know, on both sides of the family, you know, just um, it was really neat. And then the area that I grew up in is called Cooper's Corner. And um, Mrs. Cooper was 102, I think, when she passed away. And I was one of her caregivers for the, like the last 15 years of her life when I was young and in high school and college, um, being able to help and spend time with her every day. And so, you know, the things that I learned from my grandparents and then Mrs. Cooper um, were, you know, to preserve the harvest and, you know, and not waste anything. And one of those things was learning how to wash produce. So um, Mrs. Cooper mostly had taught me how to use vinegar, which now um, I've learned, you know, all the reasons why I use vinegar. But here in the United States, it's 5% distilled white vinegar is what you use. Um, in some countries, it's called 4.5%, and that's totally fine. And then I've learned in some countries, it's just called white vinegar. So, but for here in the United States, the 7% is used for cleaning your showers and your laundry. It's not used for food. So if you're in the United States, make sure it's the 5%, not the 7%. So other countries, it's just safe <laughs> for your produce. But that kills off mold spores, listeria, E. coli, other harmful pathogens. I don't know if you've heard, like just this week, um, strawberries have been recalled again for hepatitis A. Like, you know, these simple things are helping like protect your family. You know, lettuce and greens are most one of the most recalled items and you can actually bring it home and make it safe for your family to eat and not have to worry about recalls and, and different things. But I soak it in a large bowl with a quarter cup of distilled white vinegar, that's 5%, for only two minutes. And it's so important when you're like washing your strawberries that you're setting that timer because it goes so quick and there's been a lot of people that have copied me and wanting viral videos after I've done this. Um, and they're saying to soak it for like 10 or 15 minutes. Like you will ruin your berries. Like don't do that. Like two You'll minutes is, them. yeah, two minutes is all you need. And then I rinse them off and I lay them out to dry on the counter. And here in the Seattle area, it takes about three hours um, until they're bone dry. And then I put them in a glass jar um, with a lid and a paper towel. So these, these were purchased right before Memorial Day. I can't remember. I haven't went to the store since before Memorial Day. And so, and tomorrow's our anniversary, um, which is the first day of summer. So, um, happy anniversary. <laughs> thank you. So it's been almost a month um, for sure um, since I got these. And then, um, but you lay them out to dry and make sure they're all the way dry and put them in the fridge. And I store everything. When I first started doing it, I was doing it in pickle jars. Um, and then over the years, I've I've gotten bigger jars and different jars and all the things, but um, pickle jars is what I used to use and canning jars um, in the fridge. But you can literally have strawberries that last three weeks. Blackberries and raspberries will last two and a half to three weeks. Strawberries last that three to four week mark. Grapes will last four to six weeks and blueberries last six to eight weeks. I have some blueberries in the, in the fridge right now that are seven weeks old. They're from the Last time I went grocery shopping, not this time, the time before. So, and I haven't been to the grocery store in four weeks right now. So, I mean, we have fresh produce. There's plenty of things to eat. And then learning how to store like different items. So like we have, you know, oranges here that are fresh and they will, you know, stay fresh longer. You know, if you put them in the fridge, you know, these, these oranges were probably picked in December and we're in June right now. And, you know, and apples, you don't think about, you know, apples are only harvested one time a year. And so those apples that you're getting at the grocery store most likely are a year old already when you're getting them from the grocery store. So when you're washing them and putting them away, you can, you know, have food security with fresh produce, too. And something people don't think about, but I actually store watermelon, too. So watermelon's one that will last about six weeks after you bring it home. 
So if I go to the grocery store, I'll eat like the cantaloupe and pineapple and other things that are in season first. But that watermelon will last around six weeks. So like at the end of the summertime, I always get watermelon and it'll last until like mid-October. I actually carved one as a jack-o'-lantern one year. I think it was during the pandemic because I didn't want to go <laughs> get um, pumpkins. But um, anyways, um, but the watermelon, if you keep it whole and you wash it when you bring it home, you can keep it in your pantry and it'll stay fresh for about six weeks. And then as I cut it, I put it in a jar in the refrigerator and it'll stay fresh for about two more weeks in a jar. But you just have to drain the juice off every couple days. And I get teased about this all the time because I do drain the juice on this one down the sink. I don't um, drink it because I am diabetic. So I need to eat the fruit in the whole form. So I did that on a video one time and I got blasted like oh you should be using that and I'm like well technically I can't <laughs> so but you can use the juice however you want it to get it off the watermelon <laughs> so it's not sitting on there <laughs> but you know, that is so that is so fascinating because I have to tell you something about vinegar and about the white vinegar during 2020 I got I had uh, like it was maybe January. So nothing had happened. The virus had not materialized. And I had developed um, some problem on my left foot. And I don't know like what the medical way to describe this would be, but basically, you know, we have all these like little capillaries or whatever in our feet. And I, and I guess they circulate liquid, you know, through our body. I'm not, a, I'm like, so not medical, you know? <laughs> but one ha something happened with one where it was just like building up fluid and not like ter properly circulating, not exactly sure, but in any event. So I had to go to actually a dermatologist, which was kind of funny. And they had to just make a little incision and, and um, like cauterize something away and then stitch me back up. Well, I don't heal it. It doesn't heal very well. And the doctor said, oh, this can happen. You know, things on feet, you know, can sometimes not heal well. And I also made a mistake of keeping the bandage on too long. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, what are you gonna do? Okay. <laughs> well, then the virus hits. Mm -hmm. And she's not considered an essential medical person as a dermatologist, so she has to close her office. But I developed an infection. Mm -hmm. uh, but she was so kind because I had her phone number and we were texting back and forth. And, you know, back then it was even difficult, like, to get to the drugstore, which was in the grocery store and, you know, all of that. She told me, take white vinegar, mix it with water, saturate a cloth and put that on your foot twice a day for 10 minutes and just let it sit there for 10 minutes and then you know wash it with uh, soap and water and then air dry it healed see <laughs> and you believe it's on sorry i mean to go on so long i i like like drew that story out. but the point was here, a doctor is, this is a medical doctor telling me to use, in essence, vinegar. And I said, I can't believe this has worked so beautifully. I wish like I had done it early on, you know, after I had had the incision. And she explained just what you explained, that vinegar kills an assortment of different types of bacteria. And so that's an uh, just an excellent alternative at least you know that not a, you don't always want to have to rush to take antibiotics right because they get your gut health all screwy and then you got two it. years <laughs> yeah and the simple vinegar and water so it's amazing that you just two minutes and and you're preserving something and it's fascinating to me that even your watermelon after you cut it and put it in the jar lasted longer mm -hmm. than what most watermelon would last under normal circumstances. It's almost like just a short cleaning of the rind permeated enough 
maybe, you know, I, I don't know. Well, that mindset too of just not knowing, not knowing that you can, you know, get fruit that's going to last longer and how to store it. Um, when, and, and I didn't know, like I didn't grow up putting fruit in glass jars. My grandma used to put them in country, country crock containers, you know, like on the plastic Tupperware everywhere. But, um, I, we were foster parents um, before the pandemic, and when our littles came to live with us, they didn't really know produce, and um, there was four of them under seven, and so um, there was a lot of little hands, <laughs> like, um, wanting things, and it was hard. One, we're an allergy family, so we didn't have all the packaged items and stuff that they were used to. And so it was kind of a culture shock a little bit to come and see whole foods, you know, like, and we made cookies and stuff all the time. Like there was snacks and stuff. But when I open up my fridge, it's beautiful. Like, and in over the years, I had started putting things in glass because I was trying to remove the plastic out of my kitchen. I, I felt a need to do that. And, um, and when the littles like started pointing at, you know, being able to say, you know, I want this, but not knowing the name for that, you know, and then eventually it's like, I want red or I want blue or, you know, and then they started learning the names for the produce items that they wanted. But I really taught them how to eat a rainbow, you know, every day and snacks came straight from the fridge. And, um, you know, and it's just so interesting to me that, I ended up putting strawberries in a jar so they could see things better and then realized that these washing techniques that I used, like now all of a sudden, not only were they clean, but they were lasting a lot longer. Like once mm -hmm. I like mastered, you know, the whole process of doing this, but I just, I just believe it was just how God lined things up that, you know, we, we felt for a while that our calling was to help you know, with these children. And then I ended up putting strawberries in a jar and they have, they're not here anymore. And, you know, in here, the strawberries in a jar hack has changed my life. And we're literally reaching like a million moms a month, you know, and it's just, it's so incredible that like, I've had this heart for generational change that I've been instilled from, you know, Mrs. Cooper and my grandparents and daily what I do with um, my husband's grandma um, that I consider my grandma. Um, but that those generational lessons that we're learning and, you know, expanding on and then now being able to teach to other younger moms, I just I just think is so amazing. And um, it's just it's just everything to me to be able to do this and you know, to know that there is somebody that is wanting to learn, you know, just as much as I like le listening to your videos and learning from you and, you know, gaining that knowledge that you have that you're passing on. Um, I just, I just truly value being a social media influencer and it like breaking down all the norms of what that means, <laughs> you know, like really being able to educate others and give others hope. And, you know, over the pandemic, you know, it was, it was such a scary time. It, you know, I'm here in the Seattle area. We were, we're within 30 minutes of where the first U.S. cases were, you know, like our grocery stores were the very first ones in the country to shut down. And we were the very last state to open back up afterwards. So like we were, we were closed down for so long and all you heard on the news and, you know, different places was just all this negative stuff. And to be able to go and listen to your videos during that time and it just being so peaceful and calming and giving you hope and um, and just knowing that it was OK to store these foods, you know, and to store them safely. <laughs> I have like the funniest story. So my husband's grandma is 94 and she fell in January and she lives by herself. She's totally self-sufficient, all the things like she was driving at Christmas time. So this all has like, it's kind of knocked her down a little bit. And so I've been there almost every single day since January to help her. And one of the things was being able to clean out her fridge when she was in the hospital. And in the last 10 years or so, she has gotten a new fridge. And so, you know, I was, you know, going through a fridge and I've wanted to do it for a really long time <laughs> and I'm going through her fridge and I'm finding these items because she is, you know, a depression era baby, you know, and like that idea of just buying, buying, buying more, but nothing about food rotation at all. It just, what can you 
hoard with food, you know, like just that not being able to ever get it away and never having enough. And um, I'm cleaning out her fridge and there are these packages of um, chicken, like, you know, those tinfoil kind of packages or those foil packages of tuna fish. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So they're, they were like that, but they were um, of tuna or of, of chicken, not tuna. In, in her fridge. And so I was like, okay, you know, like, you know, we'll see, you know, and I'm looking at the date. Those chicken packages were from 1993. Like my husband and I were in high school 30 years ago <laughs> and dating and those packages have been in our fridge for 30 years, oh 30 God. years. She had chicken that was 30 years old <laughs> in her fridge. And so I'm doing this in January and I, um, I was teaching one of our classes at our high school in one of the food science classes and talking about this, you know, whole subject and everything. And I was saying like, there was mayonnaise in there from 2004. And there was, you know, like all of these things, mayonnaise that she was eating, you know, like you could tell that she had been eating <laughs> and they're like, that's older than me. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, Oh my goodness. Like, it's just, it's so interesting. But, like, I believe in having food security in our house, and I do inventory and rotate it. And, you know, grandma just doesn't. Like, she just wants to have food security, but the food that she has at her house is unsafe to eat. And, and then still not being able to part with it. Like, this is not safe. You have plenty. There's other things here that, you know, can replace this, but it's just... It's just been such a learning experience for me the last six months, um, being with her every day and having this other, you know, she was, she was raised in the city. She wasn't raised, you know, on a farm like me, like all these different culture shocks, you know, kind of for both of us and being able to gently help her let things go that are just not safe to have in our house anymore. And, you know, I teach families, I have a grocery course and, and I teach families and our local food bank. I have a, a course that I teach with our local food bank um, to help have food security in your house, but to how to rotate those items. And so you're not, you know, just in that hoarding mindset and it not getting rotated and you're actually using it. So you're actually saving your family money, not just buying it to hide underneath the bed and never think about it again, you know, and um, it just... It's just interesting, you know, three years ago, I might not have understood that mentality that grandma has. That, that is so true. I think that uh, the, one of the most important things when you are putting together your pantry and thinking about food security is to remember to rotate food. You know, there are some things that you can kind of keep as, you know, your forever foods that you kind of know really don't expire or go bad. Uh, they may lose some nutrition over time, whatever the case may be. But for the most part, that is so important to kind of get, develop that mindset of first in, first out. Mm -hmm. And that's, I always tell people, it's so important to know what you have and to try to do an inventory. And the initial inventory can sometimes be a little overwhelming if you've never done one before. You know? <laughs> and, and then you start finding these things, like you said, 20 year old bags of, you know, tuna fish or chicken, you know, and so on and so forth. But I think that once you get into uh, a habit of that, and that's kind of, I have these, um, little inventory sheets that I made for what, you know, I call, you probably have heard me say at the Four Corners Pantry, <laughs> the working pantry, your fridge, your freezer, and then your extended or what we nickname, you know, the prepper pantry. And I, I tell people, there's no email required, nothing, just print these out, just start. And, you know, and my website's the same as my YouTube channel, Mary's Nest, uh, just marysnest.com. And I say, I, I don't want this to be difficult for you. I feel like you, Amy, I want, it's so important to me to teach this and to help people so that these habits are developed, number one, of stocking your pantry, but also understanding first in, first out and doing an inventory, knowing what we have. 
and preserving the skills of how to cook, how to make traditional foods, how not to waste, all of these things that I worry, I don't want this to be lost. And I think that you have such an important message that you share in, about, you know, I'll often talk about, you know, clean out the crisper when the veggies are getting a little past their prime, you know, and we got to make a soup or do something with them. <laughs> but I think that you have a really good message that a lot of us have been missing in that we store our food best we can, we do the best we can with our fresh food, and then we try to clean out our crisper or clean out our fridge and make meals with these things uh, where no one's even going to notice that the food was a little maybe past its prime, but it's still safe to eat, of course. Right. Uh, but knowing how to preserve, how to take food that's fresh and extend it, you know, this is, and, and what I really like about what you share is that you're not saying, okay, you need a lot of fancy equipment to, mm -hmm. to, uh, preserve this. Yes. It's great to have all these different food saver devices or whatever, but I'll confess to you that sometimes I just want a really simple way to keep my food fresh. I don't want to bring out the big machine. I'm like, maybe I'm feeling a little lazy or I'm a little tired, you know. I'm well into my 60s now, and there are days when I'm like, gee, that chair in the kitchen looks really comfortable. I don't want to sit down, you know. I just want to relax. But, uh, you know, and I don't really feel like bringing out a food saver or whatever the case may be, or, you know, and I laugh at myself because sometimes I'm like, okay, where did I put the jar attachment? And I got to suck. Oh the yeah. Attachment. I can never find that either. <laughs> you know, when we, when we run, as you and I do, when we run these traditional foods kitchens and we live, I, I'm not sure where, where, where your house is like, but I live in an old house and, you know, I don't have a lot of space and sometimes I'll like squirrel things away and I'm like, I know I put that in an important place. Where did I, where did I, <laughs> and I can't find it or whatever. And I love the idea of I always have white vinegar. Mm -hmm. I have it in the bathroom. I have it under my kitchen sink. I make sure it's a five percent. If it's in there, <laughs> and actually, you you taught me something today. I use five percent everywhere. <laughs> I use well, it. That's fine too. Just don't do it the other way. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, I, I, you know, it's funny. I, I always just, cause it's, it's interesting. Cause with canning, they always say, mm -hmm. even though sometimes the vinegars at the grocery store will say like canning and pickling, but the canning books will say 5%. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need any fancy, fancy type vinegar, right. you know, and I'll just buy the 5%. I have it in my bathroom. I have it in the garage. I have it in the uh, under my sink in the kitchen. We use it. My husband has some. That's why we have some in the garage. My husband uses it to flush out the uh, air. Is it the air? Yeah, the air conditioning unit. I don't. He has to go up into the attic and he has to pour something in the pipes to maintain everything. I mean, it's like a miracle solution. <laughs> and learning from you, uh, the. The, you know, I've washed vegetables before and sometimes, you know, maybe I was putting a little vinegar in the water, you know, it was just willy nilly. I didn't have a system and I love learning the system from you and the proper time frame because I do use the vinegar for making quick pickles mm -hmm. and you are so right. If you leave strawberries in vinegar too long, they start to macerate just like they do if you had sprinkled mm -hmm. sugar on them. Yep. And that can be tasty and used in a particular way, I don't know. <laughs> but it's not going to help the whole process. And so I think that uh, you really narrowing this down and figuring out how to um, the right amount of time and then how to store it with the paper towel and the glass jar. Everything that you you teach is like you said, we're preserving these skills that uh, we can always be learning, we can always be adding to our repertoire for how to preserve food 
uh, in a, a bunch of different ways. I often talk about having multiple streams of food. You always hear like the, uh, I don't know who, like different people on the radio. I don't know if it's like a day or something like that. Uh, but, you know, these, these different financial gurus will talk about having multiple streams of income. And one day I was saying multiple streams of income. Okay, yeah, that'd be nice. But I need to have multiple streams of food because I'm always thinking of food security. And so I think that have knowing how to home can, knowing how to ferment, knowing how to dry food, uh, all, all the different ways that we can preserve food and preserve them in relatively easy or simple ways that don't necessarily require us to make a big investment. Like, yes, would be great to freeze dry things. Sure. Right. <laughs> but I, I don't know about, I don't have a freeze dryer. The price, my goodness, it's expensive. <laughs> now, now I know that, I know that, you know, people, uh, feel that over time, and I understand that they pays for themselves. It's an investment. <laughs> it's an investment, yes. And as opposed to maybe buying free dried foods or whatever the case may be. But sometimes, especially during the times we're in now when money is very tight <laughs> for many of us, that it's difficult to allocate money for expensive equipment. And sometimes it can even just be difficult to allocate. And, and and I'm sure you can really relate to this, you know, having children and having also been a foster parent, sometimes there are a lot of expenses with children. And if you're looking at your budget, you have to allocate your money accordingly, you know, for the things that are most important. And then being able to have ways to preserve food that make it very easy and very affordable is such a boon to the homemaker and especially the young homemaker with children when money often is very tight. And so this is just a wonderful, I, I really feel this is a wonderful uh, skill you're teaching uh, and how to preserve in one more way uh, than what often many of us think of as sort of the routine traditional ways that we've been doing you know, for many years with uh, fermentation and canning. Now we can keep food fresh and for a fairly long time. And that's really nice if you only have to go to the grocery store once a month or if you can't get to the grocery right. store, but maybe you've got a garden, you know? So the, these are really important things. And I really like that we're trying and it's not not just you and me you know i think there's a whole social circle of of uh men and women on youtube who are it, we feel very passionate about this we feel very passionate about wanting to keep traditional skills alive you know we focus you and i focus very much to the traditional the traditional cooking skills and preservation skills in the kitchen and that really is, you know, it's, it sounds a little corny because I know people use the expression a lot, but the kitchen's the heart of the home <laughs> and feeding people is very important and feeding people nutritiously, but also deliciously. And of course, safely, you know, we never want to, to have anybody uh, become ill because of our cooking, you know, that would be horrible, but it's it's not just about nutrition it's also about making things appealing to the eye and when food looks fresh it's very appealing to the eye and it's very tasty it's juicy you know especially in the case of of the strawberries or crisp as you shared in the case of the lettuce uh, this this is just it's just a wonderful way to you know i my husband will often say to me oh you really the way I show love, me, Mary, he'll say to me, the, you really show love through the food preparation and you really like to feed people. And I do. <laughs> and it's sort of funny because we're a small family. Uh, it's the two of us and then we have our one son. 
And it's funny because, it, especially with my Italian heritage, and my husband has learned the word abudanza <laughs> in abundant. And, and <laughs> oh yeah, you cook abudanza, <laughs> and there's like three people, and I'm like, you know, oh honey, are, are there like 25 people coming over? <laughs> you know, but it it's really the way we show love, you know. And so it's not only for our families, but then we expand it. And we want to show love and feed other people, feed our friends, feed our neighbors. And then we want to teach these skills so that other people can show love to their family by keeping these wonderful uh, traditional skills alive, as well as, you know, new skills. And I'm sure there were ways that traditional cultures had in keeping food fresh, but what an easy modern way you share with some vinegar, I mean, some vinegar. I mean, it's right. just, it's, it's wonderful. It's so simple and it's so quick. And now whenever I come home uh, with, you were mentioning blackberries earlier, I had gotten some blackberries on sale at our uh, local grocery store. And I said, oh, I wanna keep these fresh. <laughs> I know Amy taught me. You yeah. don't have to go in the freezer. You can actually keep them fresh. I get, like, it seems like it's daunting. Like when mm -hmm. you go to the grocery store and then you have to like wash everything and put it away. And, and then I get people that say, oh, I don't have time for that. It normally to do a whole like three week, three weeks worth of groceries, no matter if our family size was bigger or now that it's smaller. Um, it takes about 30 minutes for me to wash everything and lay it out. And then I go rest or I go do something else while it's laying there drying. And then it only takes like 10 minutes to put everything in the glass jars and put it away in the refrigerator. So 45-ish mm -hmm. minutes once a month or once every three weeks to have fresh produce the whole entire time. Like, but, you know, we don't even think about how often we used to go to the grocery store. Can you stop and pick up this? Can you do this? Mm -hmm. Like all of those minutes of stopping and doing that, you know, all of the time we realized was just a time suck for us. But, you know, we spend right now with the inflation, it used to be $100 per person in our family. And now we do $135 per person in our family once a month for our grocery budget. And that's eating organic, you know, as natural as I can get, you know, all of the things. And, you know, not having to go into the grocery store to get an avocado that's going to expire in two or three days. Well, I can teach you how to keep an avocado fresh for a month. You know, I have avocados that are fresh in my refrigerator that are a month old, you know, and not having to go and grab that one or two things that ends up being a whole cart full of things because you saw something on sale and the kids want something, you know, all of those different, you know, money saving tips happen when you can spread out those grocery shopping trips. And, you know, it doesn't have to be for three weeks. If you can get through a whole week without going to the grocery store, you've drastically helped your family's budget. That is so true. That is so true because occasionally when we usually will shop once a week, maybe sometimes every other week. But if we just pop in, if we just say my husband and I around, we say, oh, maybe we just need X, Y, and Z. Oh my gosh, the cart's full. <laughs> you know, we just see all these things and we're like, oh yeah, okay, maybe we need some of this and some of that. Staying out of the grocery store is the key to saving money. And if you can get to the point where you only have to shop once a month, I think the budget that you've set is actually very doable. Because yes, and you had to increase a little, you know, with inflation, the prices definitely are higher uh, lately in the, in the grocery store than they were uh, at, uh, a few years ago. But that's still a really good budget. And I definitely feel the more that you can not be making these short little trips into the grocery store, the more money you're going to save in the long run. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of things that can be very difficult to not be tempted <laughs> by grocery specials and you might say oh well I, I maybe I need that maybe I can use that whatever and I have found that over the years becoming more aware of what I'm bringing into my kitchen 
and using it up and keeping track of what I've got, I've saved so much money. I mean, and then if, and then if I can even stretch those trips out farther, I'm going to save even more. And looking at everything, and I'm sure that you do this, especially being, you know, you said you have the gluten-free mm -hmm. uh, household, and I'd be interested in hearing more about that, uh, that you, when you have food and it looks fresh and appetizing, and then you pull that out and you make meals, you use it up over the course of the month, you feel very rewarded that very little went into the garbage, very little had to be turned into, you know, as I said, clean out the crisper meals. And you develop this habit and like 45 minutes to prep food for a month, fresh food for a month, that's really not a lot of time. I mean, think of how much time uh, being a home canner yourself, you know how much time it takes to, to home can. I mean, that's a day. You know, that's an event. You know? <laughs> it is. And then a rest day afterwards. <laughs> I, I remember one time I was turning a bunch of citrus. So you were showing your citrus before I was turning. I had like got a buy on citrus and I was like, oh my gosh, I got to use all this up and I don't want to waste any. And I was making marmalade. And it was like nine o'clock at night and I'm like sweating and I'm like getting the hair out of my face, you know, and I'm like still putting the jars in. And I'm like, oh, I'm exhausted, you know, but I, but it, it is, it's so important. The, the less we can go into the grocery store, the better we, it, 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 there's just no bones about it. You're going to save money because it is very difficult, at least for me, and maybe there are others out there who feel the way I do the temptation of the bargains once mm -hmm. you go in and, may, and not necessarily bargains that you need, you know, but it, it, the temptation to, to not, you know, take the, uh, the, uh, in central Texas, we have HEB and oh yeah, they have really good buys, you know, and they put these little yellow coupons and they say, Oh, you know, buy $30 worth of this and get $5 off your basket. And you're like, Oh, wow, that's, I gotta take advantage of that. You know, so <laughs> the less I go into the grocery store, the more money I save. It's interesting going from like having a larger family at home just, you know, a couple of years ago to now it's just my husband and I, that transition of like not overcooking and not wasting like leftovers and different things. I have um, reflective sympathetic dystrophy. And so um, it's like a pain syndrome, um, kind of like fibromyalgia. Um, so I have good weeks and I have bad weeks and I can have a you know good day and a harder day, all those kind of things. And a lot of the skills that I've learned over the years to batch cook and put meals in the freezer and different things are because I never know when I'm going to have a great day or not. <laughs> and um, and to be able to pull those meals like right out of the freezer is just so it's crucial for us. And but you like people that don't batch cook or don't prepare meals at home, they don't realize how easy it is. Like mm -hmm. when you're making dinner and you can just, you know, divide it up and put two more portions in the freezer and have two more dinners worth, it's still the same pan. Like you didn't, you know, you didn't worry about having to mess up the kitchen multiple days. You know, you're just putting it in the freezer for another night instead of it going into the refrigerator for wishful thinking, you know, <laughs> that somebody's going to eat it, you know, like, you can easily plan ahead and make meals and get them in the freezer so you can pull them back out. And that is one of the things that has really saved us um, with going from having a larger family to now the two of us is like, yeah, I still cook, you know, six chicken breasts at a time, but we're going to eat the two and the other four I have a plan for, you know, and, and thinking ahead instead of just hoping people show up. <laughs> you know? That is so true. I Batch cooking is such a lifesaver. And I'll make a, like a big, big pot of a bolognese, and then I will divide it into threes. Mm -hmm. And we'll have the bolognese uh, with some spaghetti or whatever I'm serving. And then I love knowing I have those two batches in my freezer. 
And then, especially now with our son being home, he really enjoys that. And knowing I can just pull that out at a minute's notice when, you know, sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, what am I going to make for dinner? Or I just got out of my routine or I forgot to defrost something or, or whatever the case may be. Even with certain things that are frozen, it's really easy to reheat them when they've already been prepared. And All the love's I, already in it. <laughs> yeah, and I love, I love the, uh, yeah, I love the idea of like cooking the chicken. I, you know, I could roast a chicken every day. I love roast chicken. <laughs> And I just find it so easy because, you know, I can just pop it in the oven and I'll often just roast two chickens and then I'll serve one for dinner and then what's ever left over, we'll have that the next day, you know, sort of reincarnated, so to speak, into something different, you know, their tacos or soup, whatever. And then I've got the carcass. make For the bone broth, yeah. Right? <laughs> but I love having that other chicken. And then I'll take all the meat off of that and then I will freeze it in different containers. Mm -hmm. And then whenever I think, oh, gee, what am I going to make tonight? And I say, oh, I've got cooked chicken in the freezer <laughs> and I can take a batch out. I can do chicken tacos or, or whatever I feel like doing. That is a really wonderful skill. So between saving, you know, learning how to preserve fresh food so that it stays longer in your refrigerator, learning how to batch cook so that you have, so, and then freezer meals, whatever people mm -hmm. call it. So batch cook freezer meals, and you've got that. Now you're really getting into a system because people will often ask me, and I'm sure you get this as well, and having a bigger family than me, people will say, what, what's the rhythm like? How do you get kind of get into this where, you're, you're making real food, you're making real meals, but oh, the work and this and that. And I always say, just start with a roast chicken. It's not complicated, it's easy to do. And then you're going to have a lot of leftovers that you can serve the next day, you can uh, freeze some, and <clears throat> then you're slowly gathering up. I, I usually like to make a bone broth with three chicken carcasses. Yep. <laughs> just do one and you're starting to gather up your carcass and then you can make bone broth and then if you uh, start preserving food to keep it fresh in the refrigerator like you teach you pull a few things out like you said you've got your lettuce it's fresh it's crisp you don't need to worry that it's gone bad so you've got a, a roast chicken, you've got a salad now, you can maybe make some biscuits if you do dessert and you've got some fresh strawberries and you can do a little strawberry shortcake or whatever. And it's this whole developing this whole rhythm right. of knowing how to preserve food and regardless of what type, even we often think when we think of preserve, we think of ways that we're preserving it for a longer period of time. But now we're adding to this system, preserving and extending the life of fresh food. And so this gives you more meal options. And like you said, you're not running out at the last minute. Uh, I, uh, that I, I just, the thought of trying to make dinner and then suddenly say, oh, I don't have X, Y, or Z. I don't want to run to the grocery store for a lot of reasons. I don't want to spend extra money, but I also don't want to drive over there, you know, and if there's traffic or whatever the case may be, I don't want to, and crowds, you know, I don't want to have to deal with that. So being able to pull these things out of my fridge and have what I need and make a meal. And often what's nice is it doesn't even really have to be specific to a recipe. It's whatever you've managed to keep fresh over this period of time that you've washed with the vinegar and that is still doing nice in your refrigerator. And you know, people often laugh at me and they're like, oh, Mary, what's the recipe? And I'm like, well, you could do this, but if you don't have that, use this. If you don't have that, and they're like, Mary, why do you have the recipe? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> writing a recipe for the blog is so hard. Yeah, I'm like, I don't know, it was this much. 
<laughs> I, you know, it's so funny when uh, when I was approached to write my cookbook, the Modern Pioneer Cookbook uh, that comes out in August. It was funny because I was like, "Oh, re recipes? Um, okay, uh, measurements. Uh, uh, measurements." <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. And I had to really work through everything, you know, but it was very cute because my editor was really uh, adorable and he was, it's a man. And he said to me, I've never worked on a cookbook like this before. It's, the, you know, it, it's very interesting. It's more like a manual, you know, yes. like, you know, how to do this, how to do that. He goes, this is really interesting. I'm really enjoying this, you know, and it was I cute because that. someone who didn't know me asked me, uh, oh, could you, uh, I don't know if they asked if it was in the cookbook or if they were asking me if it was on my website, I can't remember, but it had something to do with Super Bowl snacks. Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh, have you seen my YouTube channel? And they're like, no, I'm like, I don't really do Super Bowl snacks and stuff. I'm sort of teaching how to render animal fats. You know? <laughs> I, like, I like, I get nervous, you know, when people say, oh, do you have a recipe for this? I'm like, oh, I have very basic traditional foods. And I often don't get like the most involved I'll get will be like making jalapeno poppers. You know? <laughs> Okay, I hope that is good for the Super Bowl. <laughs> but it's, you know, I, make, I just make these very traditional things. And that's what I really love about being able to keep fresh food fresh. Because I like to, you know, I've always been kind of a fan of um, people who write cookbooks like Alice Waters, where mm -hmm. it's just taking uh, fresh food and just, presenting it or preparing it in a very simple way to maximize its freshness that people can enjoy and can eat. I, I don't tend to do recipes that really in, involve a lot of ingredients and a lot of, because I also don't want to have those ingredients and in that they right. may go to waste. Or, you know, like you said, you, you look in your pantry and like, oh, gee, this is 10 years old. <laughs> you know what, I bought it and I opened it and then I never, you know, used it again for a particular recipe. But uh, I like uh, I like the idea of having nice fresh food, presenting it, uh, you know, with maybe a little dressing of some olive oil and a, you know a couple of herbs, or and and allowing the flavors of the fresh food to really shine, to let them be the star of the show, and then. In colder months, uh, where maybe you know you are doing a super stew, even at during those times, uh, if if you don't, if you can do something that really lets the food shine and isn't necessarily you know where you're just sort of cleaning out the fridge, but uh, you can have. I love to do a soup where I'm putting in fresh vegetables that when you serve it, they still have crisp to them. Right. They still yeah. have that garden fresh feel or taste. And I, I just, I love that. And so being able to extend them in the way that you share is, it's just so helpful. It, you know, it really opens up a whole new uh, realm of recipe preparation and meal preparation, or recipe making and meal preparation, uh, because you now have more options available to you, uh, at, as well as because you didn't have to go grocery shopping as often. So you've got the fresh lettuce, so you've got the fresh fruit. Uh, and I, I love what you're saying about avocados because, uh, how many times have you bought an avocado and you don't even, you know, I'll even, I'll put it in the refrigerator because I'm so terrified to leave it on the counter because it's going to be brown the next day and all, you know, you're going to go to squeeze it and it's going to be soft, you know? And so learning how to the, all these little tips and tricks that you share, it's very, it's, it's really eye opening and just so helpful. So for the avocados, if you store them in the fridge next to a lemon, 
they will stay fresher longer. They're produce buddies, and they they keep each other fresh longer. Mm-hmm. So um, it's just it's just really funny. Like these skills that I've learned. Um, we have a plant major in college, and so she's like, "Mom, it's not this, it's that. Like it's not <laughs> mom magic. It's you know the vascular system of the plant does." Da, 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 da. And I'm like. I don't know. It just works. <laughs> but it's neat that she's able to like now research the things that I just thought look pretty in the fridge. And now we're like, oh, it's this and this, you know, make that. But um, I just I wanted to get back to your cookbook because I I will one, I want to show you this cookbook that I have first. But then I am so excited to talk about yours. But my my husband's grandma, um, she is 94. Last year for my birthday, she gave me this cookbook um, and it's like falling apart and it like has all these handwritten recipes in it that I honestly, it's really, they're really hard to read. I can read cursive, you know, all the things, but they're, they're really hard to read. And if she wouldn't have told me when she gave it to me, see, it's all falling apart. I'm so careful with it, but I didn't know my grandma is 94. This was actually her mother's cookbook. So this cookbook is like a hundred years old. And um, it's just so neat, but I'm scared to use it. I'm scared to open it. I don't want to have, you know, liquids next to it. I don't want to get my fingers dirty and be changing pages. Like, yes, I do want to make recipes out of it, but I honestly just want to protect it so much. You know, it's such a treasure. And I just love that you have are releasing a cookbook that you've been working on. Um, it'll be available August 15th, right? Um that I won't be scared to turn the pages on and it will have the same depression era, just special recipes in it. Um, And I'm so excited to hear some of your recipes that you're going to have in the cookbook if you want to share a little bit more. Well, I, I am just so impressed with that family heirloom that you have. That is really something to treasure. I can understand you wanting to be so careful with it. What a gem of something. I wonder if, you know, sometimes they make um, this like a little off topic, but they, I think they make boxes yeah. that are made to uh, like um, pull out, you don't know if it's like moisture or things that can make pages degrade or something. And you know, maybe like they sell them sometimes at hobby shops or, or whatnot. Uh, that might be something to keep that in. That is really it's, cool. it's kind of funny because it's one of the only things I keep in a Ziploc bag <laughs> in my kitchen. But I do keep it in a Ziploc bag because I'm so afraid of anything and just the moisture in the air and different yeah. things. Um, oh, I don't care. But, and I have taken some pictures of some of the pages um, just so I can preserve them that way because some of them, the handwriting is um, older. But, you know, this is something that, if we would have been cleaning out grandma's house someday later, I would have never known this was her mother's. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she was able to pass this down to me, you know, I would have just assumed it was her handwriting and Mm -hmm. to be able to know that this was her mother's um, handwriting in these books and her mother's, you know, recipes, you know, from the early 1900s, you know, to have this. And um, it's just, it's just a treasure and um, really and I can't wait to make more recipes in it. And I do love um, that, well, kind of on two sides of my family, um, but I do love that my like pantry looks a lot like what my, my great grandma would recognize, but my great grandma was actually cousins with Laurel Ingen's Wilder. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, on both true. sides of my family, That's like we true. have like some fun, you know, family history. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, Mary in the Big Woods is my grandmother, my great-grandmother Mary. And oh then my, my mom goodness. was named after my great-grandmother. So my mom's name is actually Mary also. Oh <laughs> but um, yeah, so she's, she, was, um, she was cousins with Laura. Candidita. Oh my goodness. Everybody. That is really, that is just such a beautiful story. I love that. I love that. So I love the fact of like modern pioneering that we're changing some things, but they're still the old techniques, you know, for us, we're changing things to make them more allergy friendly, you know, for recipes and stuff to, you know, match with our needs of our families, but to be able to 
break down those basic recipes. And the one thing when I was looking through your the Amazon to look at your book, because I, I was so excited, I wanted to order it. And I didn't realize it wasn't out for a couple <laughs> more weeks. And then, um, but I was looking and you were talking about making graham crackers. And I was like, Oh, finding graham crackers that are allergy friendly are like so hard uh-huh. to do it. And so I'm really excited about that. And then I had just been on a podcast with Lisa Bass um, from Farmhouse on Boone. And she was talking about making marshmallows. And I'm like, okay, now who's making chocolate like oh, no, no, no. <laughs> the graham crackers here and go find the marshmallows here <laughs> so oh, now we just need some chocolate <laughs> but it yeah. would be just fun it's so true you know i really i i love the fact that we have the modern conveniences available to us but i really prefer when it comes to running a kitchen to run it like a traditional foods kitchen that we are preserving the skills that our moms and our grandmothers, our great grandmothers, you know, depending on our ages, whatever the case may be, uh, the way these traditional foods were made by traditional cultures for centuries, and they nurtured us and created good health and, and also didn't waste, you know, these were all very important things. And it's funny, because this was all second nature to me growing up with my parents. And then when I was a new mother and uh, I was an older mom, but my social circle was younger mothers and and their babies. And Sally Fallon's book had come out, Nourishing Traditions. Mm-hmm. And my social circle of ladies said, you know how to make all this stuff, don't you? And I said, well, for the most part, you know, like I had mentioned earlier, kefir was something I wasn't familiar with. Mm-hmm. But I said, oh, yeah, I pretty much know how to make all this stuff. And so they were like, you need to teach us. And so I was so happy. And so on Saturday mornings, all the ladies would come to my kitchen and they would have their nursing babies. The fathers would take care of the older kids and we would just start, you know, we'd do bone broth and ferments and sourdough starter and sourdough and soaking in sprouting grains and making a lot of people were interested in uh, knowing how to make sprouted breads and things mm-hmm. like that. And we just had so much fun doing that. And then I would like go to other ladies' houses, they'd have me over and it was very cute. And when uh, my son went to college, uh, he and my husband said, gee, you know, you should put your cooking classes on YouTube. Cause I was thinking I would do a, what, you know, like have it on a website mm-hmm. and uh, my husband and son said, you can do YouTube. You can, you know, just film this and make these classes available. You can reach a much broader audience. And that really made me happy because the thought of being able to teach these skills to more and more people and keep these skills alive, uh, it was, it, it just becomes such a, a mission, so to speak, so important to me. And then, uh, it was cute because, uh, a editor at Random House was looking for how to make sauerkraut. And he saw my video and he thought, gee, this is very interesting. Maybe this gal, you know, could write a book for us. And it's for their DK imprint. And, uh, you know, as a homeschool mom, I used many a DK book. And so it really touched my heart uh, because they look so pretty, you know, they do such a nice job. And so, uh, uh, they contacted me and I said, oh, that would be great. And it was cute because uh, the gentleman said, oh, you know, what do you want to, you know, or I was saying like, what should I include? And they were like, oh, just like what you do on your YouTube channel, all these traditional recipes and whatnot. And I was like, okay, you know, and I just start with how to stock a traditional foods pantry. And then I moved to a bone broth and rendering animal fats and culturing dairy, different types of dairy, also making. And I try to do things in a way to really help people who are on this type of journey. Mm -hmm. I often say transitioning from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen. And so each chapter, I try to make things very easy. You know, I show how to Uh, not only culture dairy, which can sometimes be a little intimidating, you know, kind of a new skill to learn, but I also show how to make easy things like stovetop cheeses. Mm -hmm. And then with the bread, you know, I start with a quick bread 
And then I moved to a sandwich bread. And then I'm like, okay, you've developed some skills now. We're going to try sourdough starter, you know, and it, <laughs> and then we're going to make sourdough bread. And I just take them on this journey through the whole book, little by little, trying to develop these traditional food skills. And then at the end, uh, I show how to take some of the things you've learned, how to make, and then make foods with them, make meals that you can serve your family and friends. And of course, there's, yes, there had to be some sweet treats like graham crackers and a few other things, you know, to how to make these things homemade. But it was really, a, it was a wonderful experience. It was a wonderful journey. Yeah, when you get the book and you get to go through it, um, the editor uh, came to my home with a photographer and a food stylist, and I'm actually making the food and then they're putting it on my kitchen table. You're going to see a lot of pictures of my kitchen. And they're putting it on the kitchen table and, and they're taking the food stylist, you know, they do it nice, you know. I, I don't really have that skill and I am so impressed with it where people know how to put something very nice with like a little, um, you know, like a, like a nice tea towel and right. a knife and a cutting board and do things like that. And one thing that I absolutely thought was so cute was th these people who are food style, who do this food styling for a living, they're amazing. She even, I think that in the chapter where, where uh, on dairy, you know, I, I, in that chapter is where I show, you know, how to uh, make butter and then clarify it. And, and she actually has some of the clarified butter on a spoon with like one little drop coming off. The pictures are fantastic. I, I can't really, wait to see it. I was so impressed with with how how uh, how they could do everything. But there was a lot of fun. It was quite quite an experience. And I would it was cute because I would say to the editor, OK, give me a heads up on what pictures you're going to take, because sometimes, you know, I, early in the week, I would be getting ferments going so that they would look just, okay. so, you know, <laughs> to be photographed. Or I remember one time I was up like two o'clock in the morning making sourdough bread <laughs> because I was like, I got to have this ready for them. You know, so it was an interesting experience. But what really is just, I, I just feel so blessed to have been able to do this because being able to preserve this in a format mm -hmm. that somebody's great granddaughter might really cherish someday. <laughs> uh, maybe you never know. You know, something you can put on your shelf, mm -hmm. something that, you know, no matter what happens in life, no matter what happens with the internet and videos and so on and so forth, something that like your great grandmother's cookbook, something that is tangible, something that we can have on our bookshelf, that we can pull off our bookshelf, have as a reference. You know, I, I really hope that this is a manual to help people on their journey of, of creating a traditional foods kitchen, because we've got to, we got to preserve this stuff. You know, we can't just be relying on prepared or my mother always called like packaged foods, like, you know, mm -hmm. processed foods, she'd always call them prepared foods. You know, she's like, we can't rely on prepared foods at the grocery store. We have to know how to make them ourselves, you know? So I think it's very important. And it's I have a, um, an ebook called I Bought It Now What? And it's available on thecrosslegacy.com, but also on Amazon. And so I'm like a bestseller on Amazon. And it's kind of fun um, that it teaches the top 50 produce items and how I keep them fresh for weeks. And um, but Thank to you. have it as a book, like I want it as a book so bad. You know, it's an ebook, and you know, if it's if you buy it from the website, then you can print it off, you know, but you know, to find that publisher that really sees your heart and what you want to, you know, do with this. And, you know, we're, we're just praying that we find the right one and the right connection and, you know, be able to do this. I would love to see like the book in print in a, you know, Costco or <laughs> bookstore or something at some point, you know, that people really can have it, you know, on their countertops and being able to reference it and, 
it's just it's such a huge goal I'm, a goal of mine but it is really neat to say that I'm like officially a best selling author cuz it's on the I will definitely I will keep you in my prayers cuz that's a wonderful <laughs> that's a wonderful uh, a book that you have that really teaches valuable skills so and nice that um, mine is under like gardening and fruit. So we're not even comp competing authors either because it's not even listed under <laughs> cookbooks. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Just kind of funny. Oh, but. but you know what? I am a firm believer, and I I always see this. I always not see this. I always say this that uh, a rising tide, as they say, raises all ships. And I love to see uh, success across the board. It, it makes me so happy. You know, I, I love the social circle and I'm so glad to know you now. I love the social circle of traditional foods cooks that we've created here on YouTube. And I encourage, you know, so many people and, you know, of, of, of your uh, viewers, I encourage you if this is, a passion that you have and and you have traditional cooking skills uh, share them share them in any way that you can uh, share them you know on the local level or share them on a national or an international level through social media whatever platform uh, you're comfortable with uh, you know I tend to really lean to YouTube I kind of find I find YouTube uh, so straightforward, you know, because you <laughs> make a video, upload it, you get comments, you can answer comments, you can help people. It really is like, you know, it's it's the modern day, you know, online classes uh, right. so speak for the type of things that we teach. You know? So, yeah, I always tell I always encourage people and my some of my friends who have uh, who have come on board uh, YouTube who right now, you know, have smaller channels. I really, I, I try to share a lot of information about them in my videos and on my community page on YouTube because I, I this is very important. This is, th these are skills, they can't be lost. We need to have young people especially learn how to run a traditional foods kitchen, how to cook. You know, it's sort of cute, my, my son, get such a tickle out of this because he would say oh mom you'd always uh show me how to roast a chicken because you'd say if you know how to roast a chicken you'll never go hungry and i think that this is this is very important you know and so i'm always trying to encourage people that there are more and more uh viewers coming on youtube and you hear this constantly you know, bill, billions of people and uh, are watching videos and there, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, there's a lot of people already on YouTube. And I always say, no, there, there are people who are looking to connect with you and they mm -hmm. just haven't found you yet. And when they find you and they like your particular teaching method, or the recipes or the methods that you're sharing, uh, you're opening up a whole new world for them. You know, how many people, I'm sure that you've experienced this um, with your Instagram presence as well as your YouTube presence. How many people have said, thank you so much for teaching me these things. I never learned these things. And when so I, right? There's so many people, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I have a little bit of scroll brain. <laughs> but there's so many people every day that I stop buying produce for my family because I couldn't afford it. I couldn't afford throwing it away. Like the idea that they just think of buying groceries as throwing it away instead of actually feeding their families. Like their, their kids, to know that households are eating better because I shared a picture of my refrigerator that went viral. You know, the 18 million people have now learned this hack and, you know, sharing it with others. And it's, it's just, it's just amazing. Like my, my YouTube channel is smaller, but on Instagram, you know, we're reaching, you know, like almost a million people a month. Like that's crazy. You know, once a reel goes and it gets shared, like your reach and, you know, here on YouTube, you know, you're reaching a million people a month. Like 
I, I just, you know, if I can make the difference in one family's lives, if, in one child's life, in one mom's life, if I can help, you know, bring hope back to the kitchen um, is something that we talk about a lot here, you know, that, you know, the kitchen for so long has been such a stressful place, like my generation, the millennial generation, like, it's just stressful. It's, you know, can I afford groceries and what's for dinner and not having those skills to be able to plan a little bit ahead, like it's these skills that are lost yeah. that we do need to take from the older generations and learn how to update them and make them, you know, what we need, you know, for me, it's always for allergies, you know, so to update, you know, recipes and things to make, you know, make sure that they're safe for our family to eat, you know, and, and just that hard in that calling that we want to reach out to other moms and other women and other families and, and, you know, for, for me, it's how God's using me and, oh, you know, and I'm so, I'm so blessed to be able to do this, you know, and that people are finding encouragement and I'm so just blessed to, you know, get to meet amazing people like you and, you know, have conversations like this that it feels like we've known each other for years and, and you've been in my kitchen for years, you know, as I'm prepping things and doing things, I just have your videos playing, but. You know, this is, it's just been an honor. You know, there's, I don't want to meet celebrities. I don't want to meet, you know, actors and actresses. I want to meet people like you that are really changing families' lives. And, you know, and it just, it's just such an honor. And I can't even express it more than that. That oh, I, feel I the so same believe way. in what you're doing. <laughs> oh, I feel the same way about you. It's, uh, I, I find such joy when I meet people uh, with whom share this passion, you know, for preserving these traditional food skills. And I remember one time uh, I have a friend here on YouTube, uh, where a little social circle of two ladies, Michelle, you may know her, Michelle over at Chocolate Box Cottage and Jackie over at Little Country Cabin. And it was cute. Uh, Michelle I've known for years, but uh, one day I was just watching videos on YouTube, you know, the things that are kind of surfaced on your homepage. And this video came up of this lady. And I, I'm always drawn, you know, to like videos of women and they're talking about, you know, old fashioned things. And I clicked on the video and she was so sweet. And she was talking in just a small new channel. And she was talking about nourishing traditions. And I said, okay, this is my soulmate. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I left her a comment, you know, and I, I said, oh, my gosh, you, you know, you had me at nourishing traditions, you know. <laughs> if you don't have that big yellow book in your kitchen, then. <laughs> yeah, you know, but but it, I, I, I mean, it's such a joy for me, you know, to meet people like you and, and to meet people like those other ladies. I, I just I love it. You know, it just it brings me so much joy to know that. Our circle is growing because when I first started talking about this, you know, to, to these other moms, you know, years ago, we were kind of like fringe, you know, this was not mainstream. And now I feel over the years, this has really become a, a way of living, a way of doing things, you know, and I laughed and I don't know if it was maybe 10 years or so ago. Uh, and the, uh, I saw the William Sonoma uh, kitchen store catalog and in it they had they were selling stuff. But I, it's like cute because it's like fancy and kind of like a little she she. But, but I thought it was so cute because they were showing things that you could buy to make ferments. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's gone mainstream. This is so cute, but it doesn't. It, it's just been such a joy to to know you, and and I'm so happy that you know we can be friends, and here not just on YouTube, but but hopefully in life, and <laughs> and uh, just continue to get to know each other better and share more tips uh, about traditional cooking, and and help in the process of sharing, teaching others as well and preserving these skills. It's just a, it's a real joy. And it's been just such a joy uh, chatting with you today and getting to know you better. It's, it's been so much fun. I just, I really just feel like I've sat here and had coffee with a good friend and, you know, I just, it's just been so, 
so fun. And I can't wait to see um, how we can share audiences and, you know, people that want to learn more about fermenting and, and making, you know, wholesome nutritional meals will come and follow you through me and people that are trying to save money on groceries by keeping their produce fresh longer will will switch around and we can just Definitely. help grow people's budgets and what they have available for their families and that we can help families eat better. Exactly. <laughs> Eating better, saving money, not wasting. I mean, these are all the things that... Uh, have become so important and I think very much at the forefront of, of people's ways of thinking now. And so the fact that there are people like us in this social circle, in social media, really trying to help people who are new to these concepts uh, embrace them. And, you know, I, I often say it's almost becomes like a little bit of a game. You look at everything and you say, okay, how can I use this? I'm not putting it in the garbage. I do that like a week before I go to the grocery store. What can I use up before we really need to go to the grocery store? <laughs> so. Well, I want, to, I want to thank you so much for, for chatting today and, and uh, ha letting me get to know you better. It's, it's really, it's really been delightful. This has truly been an honor. Um, we will say goodbye now and just make sure that you're following both of us at Mary's Nest and The Cross Legacy. I am on YouTube and on Instagram under that same name and dot com and I'm Mary's in both places too. And just um, we will put all the different links and descriptions in the description notes, the show notes for this YouTube Um podcast youtube whatever we were going to call it so, really it's a podcast kind of thing but um all the notes will be there at the bottom so you can follow the links and make sure that you check out mary's new book that is on pre-order right now through amazon and it'll be arriving in august so um again thank you for listening and um we will be chatting soon bye bye well, I hope you enjoyed our kitchen chat. And if you'd like to learn about how to stock your Four Corners pantry, your working pantry, your fridge, your freezer, and your extended pantry, or what we nickname the prepper pantry, and how to store your food very well so it can last as long as possible, be sure to click on this video over here, where I have a complete playlist that covers all that and more. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.